Hi, uh, my name is Rowan Coglin, and I'm pleased to be able to present to you today on how we use FME in the Historical Aerial Photography Project at Geoscience Australia. Before I begin, I would just like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, waters and community and pay our respects to the people, cultures and the elders past and present. I'll begin with some background information for you today before getting into the FME side of things. I've been involved in the Historical Aerial, aerial Photography Project since 2018 and Geoscience Australia is the custodian of a significant aerial photography collection. The data extends over 70 years, um, ranging from 1928 through to the mid 1990s and constitutes uh, over 1.2 million frames uh, of imagery. And to date, approximately 500,000 frames have been digitized. The archive also includes a huge amount of metadata, including flight line diagrams, film notes and camera calibration files. Shown in the graph here uh, is the collection plotted over time and the number of frames. As you can see, there were large campaigns to capture imagery uh, following World War II and then again in the 60s and 70s. And shown in the uh, lower left of the screen is a uh, frame over surface paradise from 1930. Uh, as I mentioned to date, approximately 500,000 frames have been digitised. Uh, the digitising effort began in 2011 and initially films that were vulnerable and degrading uh, were targeted for scanning first. Following that work, uh, there was a period of fairly sporadic scanning, uh, but fortunately in recent years, uh, we have been allocated funding to uh, increase the scanning throughput. And you can see that in the graph below showing that in the last few years, uh, the scanning numbers have increased. We are fortunate uh, to also be working with the National Archives of Australia who uh, store all the films and they are also allocating some funding uh, towards scanning. So we hope to see these numbers increasing in years to come. Although uh, a larger number of data uh, frames were scanned over 10 years ago, it is only in recent years that these have actually become discoverable by the public through the work we are doing in this project. So what has led to the data becoming more discoverable is mainly driven by the digitization of the metadata records to build a modern spatial database. Over the past uh, five years, the project has been able to digitize over 280,000 frame centroids and 43,000 flight lines. A flight line diagram uh, is a map depicting where the aircraft flew and with the approximate location of the frames of photography as shown here. Flight line diagrams often also list specifications of the capture, such as the capture dates, the camera models, the scale and the height that the plane flew. A major challenge of this project has been capturing this information as the quality of flight line diagrams varies. We often have multiple flight line diagram or multiple versions of the same diagram, sometimes with conflicting information. Shown here is a sample of a flight line diagram we have over Townsville, and you can see that the quality of this image is quite poor. In this example, we did have the, uh, the paper copy and were able to rescan it at a higher resolution, uh, which shows a lot more detail. Furthermore, we also have the same flight line diagram from our supplier who, that were, um, who have re-digitized it in color format. So this offers more information and is easier to capture in relation to the topographic map. However, this diagram uh, is missing a lot of the ancillary information as you could see on the previous one. In addition to the flight line diagrams, both the National Archives of Australia and National Library of Australia also have catalogues containing information about the films and we have had to cross-reference all our data against theirs. So what this digitization uh, effort has led to is the capture of these points and lines in a spatial database with associated attributes attached to each feature. We currently have an aerial photography hub page, uh, which contains information about the project and uh, his history of aerial photography in Australia, and also a search interface that is available to the public. We have developed a new ArcGIS Online web app and we hope to be launching that soon, and that will eventually replace the current search app. I will list these links at the end of the presentation in case anyone wants to write them down. 
So where does FME fit into all of this? Shown here, and I don't expect you to be able to see or understand much of this diagram, um, but this is the data workflow for the project. And this is where we're currently using FME. As you can see, it is a key, key component throughout the workflow. And a major challenge I had uh, when thinking of what to present uh, to you today was which example do I choose? And I couldn't choose one, so I chose multiple. I'll give an overview of a number of the FME processes we have in place. I will glance over some of them uh, and others I will dive into more detail and demonstrate how FME helps us solve our problems and support the project. So let's start at the beginning. We use our use of FME as a control and validation tool. The data we purchase uh, that is scanned, we receive on external hard drives. That comes with inventories and of course an invoice. We use FME here to provide a quick validation of the contents of the hard drive and ensure that what we've been billed for is what we've actually received. We look at both the quantity of frames we receive and the quality. The workbench is fairly simple in that it reads the contents of a hard drive using the directory and path file name reader, which effectively creates a file listing of the hard drive. This listing we can descend through various transformers, including the stat, uh, statistics calculator, to calculate a series of metrics, which we can then compare to the inventory and invoice to ensure there are no differences. The supplier is also required to scan films to a minimum specification. To test these specs, we use a Python caller and the XF read module to extract the XF data from each image and compare these against the required specifications. Again, we summarize these through the use of a statistics calculator to ensure that this uh, the specifications for each film are met. Another check in the workbench is to compare the data that we have received on the hard drive to our existing data supplies to ensure no films have been resupplied and we've been billed twice for them. Summary fields are calculated and output to an Excel spreadsheet, which the operator then expects to get a quick overview of the data and to, ensure, uh, to check if any further areas need investigation. After our QA process is complete, we move on to moving uh, the scanned imagery into our cloud environment. We rename the files before we upload to our cloud environment to ensure they are meaningful to end users. As our spatial database of frame centroids is the key data set in terms of data discovery in our user interfaces, we attempt to match the frame, numbering, frame numbering conventions to this database. Unfortunately, frame numbering over the years has been anything but consistent. As we have digitized this information off the original metadata, we have tried to stay true to that, those um, flatline diagrams and such. For example, leading zeros are often uh, captured on the flatline diagrams and we mimic them in the database. The M FME process we run here matches films on, incoming, on the incoming hard drive to the spatial database and determines the correct uh, naming convention. Once determined, frame numbers are generated to match the database and new output names are generated. Some examples shown here is, uh, for example, frame 0009 on the hard drive may be only referenced to as frame 09 in the database. Another commonality we find is frame numbering when it goes from 999 into the thousands uh, in the file names. In the database, the frame numbering often reverts to zero at this stage. And so we try to mimic those uh, conventions. The FME process outputs a simple CSV containing the input name and the output name. And then we use Python to rename those files in bulk and then push them to our cloud environment. Another check that is carried out at this stage is to determine if the film is actually captured in our spatial database. And that leads me on to the next section. which is creating centroids for missing films. A small percentage of films are not captured in our spatial database. This may be because the flight line diagram is lost or was damaged and cannot be digitized. The only way to capture these frames is to manually locate them. Without these points, there's very few ways end users will be able to discover the data and download it. Fortunately, between the various catalogs, such as the National Library and National Archives, we can generally generate enough information to 
uh, get to a rough geographic area of where the film may be. We then perform georeferencing in ArcGIS Pro due to the ease of use of the georeferencing tools. And the aim here is not to author rectify the frame, it is just to georeference it to the rough location in order, in order to allow us to capture a frame centroid, which can then feed into our main database. Our existing approach of capturing these centroids was manually dropping them on the frames in ArcGIS Pro, which is very time consuming. So we looked at FME to solve this problem. Shown here on the uh, right is the XML file that ArcGIS generates, which captures the georeferencing information. So the first challenge we had here was that ArcGIS Pro records the georeferencing information in the XML file. We don't actually generate a new image from that process. And unfortunately, FME doesn't read that XML file when reading in the image. So the first step here was to use the directory and path reader to bring in a list of all files in the folder. In this case, a, a film folder. From here, we could easily filter them based on the extension. We learned that uh, during development that the contents of the XML can vary depending on how, how each user performed the georeferencing process in Pro. So we had to do some validation on those files to begin with. We read the XML files in as text and then check they have certain components such as a spatial reference system and GCP sections. Only XMLs that pass those tests are to be processed further. In these steps, we then output a simple summary table for the user to inspect, which can quickly highlight uh, issues with the XML and allow them to correct it before the next steps of the process. The next step is to take the contents of that XML and apply them to the raster in FME. This involved reading in the XML, XML files and manipulating the GC component to generate a GCP string. This is done using a combination of XML flattener transformer, attribute exposer to bring those uh, list elements out, a list exploder to then make them individual features, and then a number of manipulation steps, mainly using the attribute manager to group those uh, components together with the end goal of coming up with this GCP string as shown down the below. This G GCP string is then used by the raster GCP applier, which is a very handy transformer uh, we found on the FME hub. It takes that GCP string and applies it to the raster and generates the georeferenced image. Once the frame is georeferenced, it is a simple process to create vector products such as footprints and frame centroids. We use Attribute Manager to populate a number of attributes which we can extract from the file names or other attributes which, are, uh, which we can set at this point. We then output the results to our defined schema, which users take back into ArcGIS Pro and continue capturing additional components such as the flight lines and adding any further attributes. This process has simplified and sped up the capturing of frame centroids and has allowed users to uh, get through much more georeferencing work. The next step I will cover off is what we refer to as an intermediate point creation. Looking at a flight line diagram, we can see that not every frame centroid is represented on the diagram. In this case, only every fifth frame is captured. If we, did, we were to deliver the digitized points as shown here, users would only be able to access approximately 20% 20 20 of the archive. So to get around this, we fill in the missing frames. This workflow is about splitting up the lines into smaller segments and then converting them to points and copying attributes across from their parent. We first split the main line into smaller segments where each vertex exists. We then calculate the number of frames along that segment so in this case, between uh, 5,090 and 5,095, there should be four additional frames and split that segment into four, or in this case, five smaller components. We then convert those five smaller lines into points um, using the chopper transformation, uh, transformer. Um, this does create a number of duplicate points. And so we, we filter them out using the matcher. We then join those points back to their parent point to transfer attributes such as camera specifications and capture dates to those points. The points are then written out uh, in, a cut down in a cut down schema to our intermediate point geodatabase. 
shown here is the intermediate uh, output once the intermediate points have been created. You can see a vast increase in the, in the data due to this process. One benefit we found during this process is it produced an unintended form of quality assurance. If you can imagine frame 5095 shown in the center here, if that was accidentally entered into the database as frame 509, once this process was run, we would have over 4,000 points suddenly appear in this section of the, the run. This immediately stands out when a user inspects the results and can be corrected in the main database before further processing. Even if it doesn't stand out, perhaps for example, the frame entered was 5093 instead of 5095, we can still pick it up as we have an FME process that looks at the average distance between each frame and then compares that to the actual distances to determine if any are outside a threshold. Those outside the threshold can be inspected further to ensure that the frame numbering in the main database is correct. So in summary, this process allows us to capture a five-fold increase in frame centers and at the same time carry out quality assurance on the data. As you've seen so far, there are lots of moving parts to our digitation effort with information coming from various sources created through various different methods and spanning a number of years during which schema has changed multiple times, leading to often inconsistencies in the data. To ensure the database is up to date, we run another validation process at this stage of the workflow. Our database is currently a flat file structure. We did experiment early on in the project with relational tables, but found they caused more issues than they solved due to the evolving nature of the project and the complex digitization work. Because they are flat files or flat tables, there is a lot of duplication between the layers, but we can test this quite easily with FME. We also have a number of database rules that we can easily test in FME. For example, every flight line should have a series of flight points that are related to it. Attributes such as the capture date and specifications of the camera should be the same between these two points. Other examples of database rules we can test is, for example, if a frame is scanned, it must have scan date and a scan package name against it. The main transformers we use in this process are feature mergers to join uh, the lines and points together and then testers, lots and lots of testers. At last count, this workbench contained over 65 testers to test all the database rules. We run this process every few months over the database and action any issues. We found the easiest way to inspect these issues is simply using the data inspector tool as it became too complex to try and write out some report, reports of all the different issues we test. In most cases, issues found th through this process are limited to a few features and we easily uh, just load up ArcGIS and action those uh, in the main database. In the event we do find a, uh, a large discrepancy, uh, we action them using ad hoc with FME workbenches uh, to do bulk database updates. The previous step gets us to a point where we are confident in the database. The next step we perform is to cut that database down into a distribution schema that can be served up through ArcGIS Online. At this stage, we perform a number of actions. We remove a number of fields that are for internal use only. These are mainly comment fields and QA fields. The next step is we perform validation of the AWS links to the frames that users will download from. So that is, if a frame is scanned, we match that frame to an AWS S3 object endpoint and populate the download URL into the attribute table. If the frame is listed as scanned in the database, but we cannot match it in AWS, we update the scan status to no, to ensure no users are delivered, uh, 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 no broken links end up in the database. There are a number of reasons this might happen. For example, the film was damaged in places um, and, wasn't able, and all frames weren't able to be scanned. Another action we take here is to embed HTML into a number of fields. This is done to enable hyperlink functionality in the pop-up windows in our Agile web app. As shown here, you can see the image download, the flight line diagrams, and other information that we link to, such as the National Library and National Archives catalogs, uh, we can generate hyperlinks to those 
uh, either files or um, archives. Uh, this came about due to a limitation in the, the web app scripting so on Agile that forced us to look for other solutions to introduce HTML into our pop-up windows. Fortunately, we were able to accomplish this with FME. Lastly, we concat a number of field, concatenate a number of fields together to simplify the schema and deliver a user-friendly pop-up. For example, in this right pop-up window, in our maintenance database, the camera company, which is Wild, and the camera model, RC10, are stored in separate fields. So we concatenate these together to deliver a simple and one only camera field to the public. The transformers used in this process are shown here. As we have one to many relationships with some fields in the database, for example, one feature can have multiple flight line diagram references, we'll need to split them up in order to validate the URLs and build HTML text. We use the attribute managers here to perform the field updates, and then we aggregate features back together before writing them out to uh, our AGOL feature service using the AGOL feature service writer. The benefit here and keep a component is we use the update mode in the writer, so we're only writing uh, features up to AGOL that actually have changed. The last component I will show you is one that we execute in FME Cloud. This is a process to generate usage reports of the data in our AWS environment. To enable this, we use AWS Cloud Trail, which uh, logs our AWS S3 object requests and includes features such as the time of request, the object path, the IP address, and the size of the data that was transferred. We have a Lambda process that runs in AWS, AWS that creates daily statistics files, which are then available to FME to read in and create usage reports from. So we use the S3 connector to stream those daily files from S3 based on the uh, date input parameter that if, uh, is provided by the user when the workbench runs. We filter out um, data from those logs that we don't uh, want to report on. In most cases, that's uh, GA where we upload, where Geoscience Australia uploads and downloads data. We don't want to report on that, so we filter those records out. We then split up the records and, and use attribute managers to pull out the film and the frame and calculate the file sizes correctly. And, do, and we use a date time converter to do any date time conversions between uh, how a, a CloudTrail logs the time of request and we convert that just to a simple date as we only want to report on, on single days and not on time. We use a bunch of statistics calculators to, base, uh, to calculate different metrics to report on. And then we use the HTML report generator in multiple locations in this workbench to generate both tables and charts to be delivered in the output report. Finally, we use the S3 connector to push the output report back to our reporting bucket in Amazon. And then the emailer that sends an email to the team to notify them that a new report is available. So this is an example of the report that's generated for a defined period. It details the total number of requests for both our TIFF and JPEG images throughout the reporting period and then the size of those data sets. It details the number of requests per day, the number of requests per day by file size, and the total number of object requests by the top 20 films. This allows management a quick view of, our, of the user side, and we can see, see trends in data access over time. We've experimented with mapping the location of downloaded frames within this report, however, need to do some more work in presenting that in a heat map style uh, to maximize its benefit. I hope this has given you some insight into how we are utilizing FME from data QA to data generation, raster manipulation and reporting in the historical aerial photography project. FME is a key component in every stage of our workflow and enables a large team working on it to run processes and generate outputs consistently without the need for them to have a deep understanding of the inner workings. We use FME because it is robust and repeatable gives us confidence in our data outputs and, place, and in places provides interim solution, solutions such as the HTML workflow for AGOL while we look and develop other um, ongoing solutions. The ability to automate, especially on FME Cloud, 
will allow us to move more of these functions into that space in the future, such as the AGOL database update process, which hopefully in time we'll be able to set up on FME Cloud and run that as a weekly um, database update. I'd like to thank you for your time today. Uh, the links to our two web pages are shown here. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact aerophotography at ga.gov.au. I would also like to acknowledge the staff, the wide variety of staff who have worked on this project over a number of years. Thank you.